Hello, I'm Matt Codner and I'm a fellow of Odd Salon sheltering in place in beautiful Upper Manhattan, New York City. Today I'll be talking with you about the 1925 Serum Run. When trains, planes, and ships wouldn't do, Siberian Huskies answered the call to deliver antitoxin to the edge of the American Empire against overwhelming odds, covering 674 miles of ice-covered terrain in just five and a half days to save the lives of children of Nome, Alaska. Now I want to start out by asking, what motivates people to do magnificent things? Why run a marathon or orbit the earth or charge hundreds of miles through bitter cold on a sled? When people achieve such feats, we often assume lofty motivations for them, that they do it to see what they are capable of, or for fame or self-worth, perhaps to help humanity or individual humans. In this story, 20 skilled humans brave unbelievably frigid, negative 70 degree Alaska weather to travel nearly 700 miles to save children from a disease. We can speculate that many of them did it, likely because, well, kids and disease is a horrifying prospect. Some because they were the only ones in the place and time with the necessary skills or sense of duty. Two of those humans achieved overwhelming fame while 18 of them lived out their lives in relative obscurity in an obscure land. Now I want to ask, what motivates dogs to do magnificent things? What makes a dog want to run a marathon or orbit the earth or charge hundreds of miles through bitter cold for a cause? In this story, 150 intrepid dogs brave frigid negative 70 degree Alaska weather to travel nearly 700 miles to save children from a disease. Two of those dogs achieve overwhelming fame, while 148 of them lived out their lives in relative obscurity. What motivated these dogs? People tend to assign less noble motivations to dogs. They assume that dogs do things out of loyalty or instinct or pack mentality or because they want a biscuit. These assumptions require us to believe that dogs only do great things because they're told to do so or because of their dedication to a human. If that's true, we must examine our own motivations and perhaps start from an assumption that we, too, can only achieve great things because we're expected or told to do so. Throughout our long mutual evolutionary history, dogs have propelled humans into greatness, comforted us during challenging times, and saved our butts when we've really messed up. It could be argued that we, as humans, could not be the species that we are without dogs. We would be just like all the other animals if we survive natural selection at all. And Nome, Alaska definitely would not exist without humans screwing up and dogs saving them. The only reason Nome exists is because in 1900, 30,000 washed up wannabe failed gold prospectors showed up from San Francisco and camped in tents on the beach. I guess it was like Burning Man, but in the snow. They didn't find much gold and they got frozen in for the winter as the Bering Sea freezes solid in October and doesn't melt until April. With no way out they got frostbitten and died, some drowned from storm surge, and almost all the survivors got on the first ships out the next spring. With about 1,200 residents it can be challenging for a city dweller to wrap your head around what a tiny town Nome was and still is. Not only is Nome tiny, but it is also far from anywhere. It is closer to Russia than it is to the next U.S. town. It's 500 miles west of Hawaii, halfway between New York City and Tokyo, two degrees south of the Arctic Circle. Then, as now, there are no roads or rail in or out of Nome. There is only sea access five months out of the year, and the town is frozen in and cut off from the rest of the world for the other seven months. Before the October freeze, all supplies come in by ship. In October of 1924, the Alameda made its final supply run before winter and then headed back to Seattle. The town's only doctor, Dr. Curtis Welch, later claimed that he had ordered a resupply of diphtheria serum to replenish his tiny stash that expired five years ago and that it never made it on the supply run. He wasn't concerned, though, as the town hadn't suffered a diphtheria outbreak to date. On Christmas Eve, Dr. Welch sees a young patient who has a sore throat. He diagnoses it as tonsillitis. When the patient dies soon after, Dr. Wealth lists the cause of death as tonsillitis. Over the next few weeks, he would see four children die from what he diagnosed as tonsillitis. Finally, in mid-January, when a fifth case of suspected tonsillitis hits, he starts to suspect something more sinister, diphtheria. 
Diphtheria is nasty stuff. Adults might survive, but it's especially lethal in children. It's a highly contagious bacterial infection that starts with a sore throat and creates a swollen membrane that slowly chokes and suffocates the victim. At the time, only serum was the surefire cure. And what's serum? It's antibodies made from the blood of horses. On January 22nd, when a fifth child is near death, Dr. Welch meets with the mayor and town leaders to let them know that an outbreak is probably well underway. The entire town is placed in quarantine and lockdown. Schools and businesses shut down and children were instructed to stay inside. A call was sent out to the public health department in Washington, D.C., and all medical establishments on the West Coast scrounged for a surplus supply of serum. Soon, a small supply was found in Anchorage. The challenge now would be to get it to Nome before the outbreak got worse. A plan was set in motion. The serum would be wrapped in a quilt and sent by express train from Anchorage to Nanana. Mushers along the 675 mile route from Nanana to Nome were given a warning order to stand ready to relay the serum west as soon as it arrived at the trailhead. The popular media has made heroes from the last two mushers in the relay. However, as any racer knows, there's a psychological advantage to finishing the race. It's starting that can be the hard part. And that start was done by Wild Bill Shannon, who ran 52 miles, starting with nine Alaskan Malamooks. He picked up the serum from the train at 9 p.m. on January 27th and got instructions from the engineer to stop at roadhouses along the way to warm up the serum and keep it from freezing. The engineer recommended that he wait until morning to take off when temperatures would be rising. But Bill responded, if people are dying, let's get started. Bill and his dogs ran through the night as the temperatures fell from negative 40 to negative 62 Fahrenheit. At 3 a.m., frostbitten and with three dogs suffering from frostbitten lungs, he stopped at a roadhouse to rest for a short while, drop off his three wounded dogs, warm up the serum, and head back out with only six dogs. Those three dogs that he left behind would later die from overworking of their lungs in the frigid cold, and Wild Bill was permanently disfigured by his own frostbite. But he performed his mission with complete disregard for his own well-being or the life of his dogs. Over the next four days, 16 mushers followed the contours of the Yukon River out to the Norton Sound of the Bering Sea. Most of these mushers were native Athabascans. We only know their very anglicized and Russianized names from and when they checked into each roadhouse, but for the most part, they did not receive radio coverage or news stories and few photographs exist of these mushers and their dogs. The media instead seemed to gravitate toward the photogenic gold company men of Scandinavian stock who ran the final legs while overlooking these indigenous heroes who traversed some of the toughest miles. On January 28th, Edgar Callens took the serum from Bill Shannon and ran 31 miles against a 20 mile per hour wind as the temperatures warmed to negative 30. He passed the serum to Dan Green who ran 28 miles to pass it to Johnny Folger who through the, ran through the night to pass the baton to Sam Joseph, who covered 26 miles in negative 38 degrees. On January 29th, Titus Nikolai mushed 34 miles, handed off to Dan Corning, who conveyed it to Harry Pitka. Then on to Bill McCarty, before Edgar Nolner passed it to his brother George, who set off on the morning of the 30th with the same dogs and sled that Edgar passed to him. George passed off to Charlie Evans, who passed to Tommy Patson, to Jack Nikolai, to Vic Victor... And a gig. On the 31st, Mild Gonigan passed off to Henry Ivanov, who handed it off to one of those Scandinavian Gold Company men. Each of these dog sled teams ran between 25 and 50 miles. 25 miles was, at the time, considered to be an extreme day's mush when conducted between 40 above and 40 below. It can be said that the men and dogs who ran these legs likely had different motivations than the ones I'm about to speak about. These men were part of an overall mission and did what they were good at to the best of their ability in order to facilitate a collective mission. The final mushers were probably a little bit more competitive. Okay, so part of me wants to skip over this because there's already a completely historically inaccurate Disney movie about these two, but despite all the fictional nonsense, Seppala and Togo were absolute superheroes. Seppala and Togo really are legendary. They covered more miles in less time than anyone far more miles. They actually did an out and back trip from Nome. Conservative accounts say that Seppala's team ran over 170 miles over three days with very little stops. 
Without clear instructions on a handoff, Seppala's team was running east at full speed across the frozen Norton Sound and actually ran past Ivanov, who was heading west with the serum. Luckily, Ivanov was able to flag down Seppala and hand off the serum. Team Togo popped a Ewing and headed west toward Nome. From there, Seppala runs 91 miles west across sea ice, darkness, a storm, and frigid weather. He hands it off to Charlie Olson, who moves it 25 miles and hands it off to Gunnar Kaysen. Kaysen, who was actually Seppala's assistant at the gold company and who borrowed dogs from Seppala's kennel, kennel, is the guy who runs into town with the lead dog Balto and takes outsized credit for his 55 mile run. At 5.30 in the morning, Kaysen pulls up to Dr. Welch's door with the serum. It's frozen solid and took another five hours to thaw, but it was enough to stave off the epidemic until the next serum run weeks later. In the end, the resilience of two species, dog and man, saved a handful of children in a tiny town on the edge of nowhere. As for other motivations, the first musher on the trail, Wild Bill Shannon, was also enticed to tour the lower 48 as a hero and clearly didn't care for that aspect. He and his dogs would agree, proper bacon is the best motivator. To quote Bill, this hero business is big blah. I want to get back where they shake hands and know how to fry bacon. A third motivation we should consider, to do a thing to see if it can be done. Both species show resilience in very similar ways. They train their bodies and minds to achieve inconceivable things, and in the end, each being has their own motivation that may be known only to them. Or maybe they don't know. Who knows? Regardless of motivations, humans and dogs owe their evolutionary prowess to a mutual resilience. As evidenced by this serum run, when these two species combine as a team, they are capable of far greater feats than they would be alone. So, here is a toast to the resilience of humans and dogs.